Oh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Ryan Bader. I'm the mayor of the city in North Battleford. And on behalf of city council and our city administration, I want to thank all of you for tuning in today for uh, the first ever State of the City 2.0 address. Um, back in uh, March, on March 2nd, we hosted our first ever State of the City address at the PAC Ballroom at the Tropic Linen Convention Center. And uh, a lot has changed since then. So today is not about repeating that information. Um, we, uh, we were able to uh, present a lot at that time about uh, the state of the city over the last year and a half, the, the change in direction and where we're going. Uh, it is not our intention to repeat, it's really to provide an update because a lot has changed since then, uh, especially considering the, uh, the arrival of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And so if you are interested in watching that presentation, uh, it is available on our YouTube channel. Uh, if you go to City of NV on YouTube and you can watch it there. So um, first uh, to begin, uh, I of course here at uh, City Hall in our council chambers in beautiful downtown North Battleford in the heart of the traditional territory of the indigenous peoples of Treaty 6. Uh, this Sunday, in fact, is National Indigenous Peoples Day. And I want to acknowledge that. It's always a important celebration in our community and one where we've made a real priority uh, with our city uh, to develop stronger relationships with the indigenous peoples of this area. Uh, two years ago, in fact, we uh, uh, erected the battle, uh, or sorry, the, um, uh, the Treaty 6 flag out front of City Hall, and that was erected as a permanent reminder for all people who live here and visit here that have the indigenous peoples of this area not agreed to share the land through Treaty 6, that our community wouldn't be here. And so we're very proud of that. Uh, also at that time, we hosted a meeting uh, with our neighbors, uh, our, our indigenous government neighbors, as well as municipal government neighbors. And over the course of that year, we developed stronger and stronger relationships until uh, we were able to actually come to uh, uh, signing of an agreement, uh, which we signed last year on National Indigenous Peoples Day. And uh, that agreement is called the Sacagawea Relationship Agreement. It's something we're very proud of. It's certainly been a priority for our city government. Uh, the signatories included five First Nation governments and two urban municipal governments, uh, including the town of Battleford and the city of North Battleford. Uh, that relationship has been very important to us over the last year. And while we cannot gather on this Indigenous uh, People's Day this weekend, uh, we will be commemorating uh, that date uh, with some. Uh, information through the media just to highlight the achievements of our uh, relationship agreement and what we're calling uh, the Battleford Regional Community Coalition uh, through the media. So you can look forward to that because we're very proud of the work that's gone on over the last year. So one of the benefits of uh, tuning in today is that uh, you get some information. We're going to start out with some some really good stuff. Uh, so actually it's you're going to hear about this before anybody else. 63 minutes ago, um, Catherine McKenna, Canada's Minister of Infrastructure and Communities, and Bill Carston, the President of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, announced that the City of North Battleford's application to the FCM Green Fund has been approved. So we talked about this at the State of the City Address, and I'll just recap what this means. Last year, the federal government announced the doubling of the gas tax. This is worth about $840,000 to the city. Uh, we thought about a variety of projects and in the end we chose to apply to the FCM Green Fund so that we could conduct a feasibility study uh, on five city facilities and their energy use. Uh, the goal of this feasibility study is to, to investigate uh, energy savings and the possibility of generating renewable energy at them. Uh, we hope to reduce our operating expenses through this, reduce our carbon footprint, and uh, create greater efficiencies. Um, today's announcement uh, with the approval means that uh, this feasibility study, uh, which uh, is gonna cost $361,000, will be half funded by the FCM Green Fund and half funded with the gas tax allocation to the city. So we're very excited about that. And uh, like I said, this was announced 64 minutes ago and you're the first to hear it here in the community. So thank you for that. I think we'll start the uh, slideshow. We have a, a variety of uh, images to share uh, as we provide some updates. And uh, we'll flip to the next one if we can. Uh, we'll start with leisure services. So when the pandemic um, became a reality, 
it changes the lives of everybody around the world, here in Canada, in Saskatchewan, and in our city of North Battleford. And uh, we do acknowledge that uh, you know, the way we've lived our lives has had to change. This will likely uh, result in a new normal for people. Um, we've had some significant um, changes within the way that we operate as a city. And perhaps the first most profound was within our parks and recreation. Um, the public health orders that came through the uh, provincial government uh, met the closure of a lot of our facilities. Uh, in late March, this meant that uh, we had to close facilities, uh, you know, indoor, outdoor, uh, our playgrounds, uh, even our skateboard park. And you can see the image there. Um, we had to make uh, our parks unusable, and unfortunately we had uh, individuals that were still congregating, so we actually put gravel on them to make them unusable. Um, the reality was that any gatherings of people provided a threat uh, for the transmission of the, uh, of the virus. And so we had a part to play as a municipal government to ensure that that didn't happen in our community. The priority, of course, was the safety uh, of everybody uh, in the city of North Battleford and, and those who were visiting the city of North Battleford. Uh, since that time, the provincial government has announced the uh, Reopen Saskatchewan plan. Uh, this is a five-phase plan that was announced in mid-April. It is evolving. It changes over time. If you're familiar with the plan, I do actually suggest that you visit the uh, Government of Saskatchewan website because they do provide updates. I think the latest update was yesterday uh, because they provided uh, a change to um, uh, the reopening of facilities. So if you go to the next slide, you see that the, the skateboard park is now open. Uh, in fact, a lot of our recreation facilities are open. People can now enjoy the boat launch uh, the North Saskatchewan River. The North Balfour Golf and Country Club is open. Uh, the David Laird uh, Campground is open. All of our municipal playgrounds are open, as are the uh, uh, tennis and pickleball courts, the outdoor ones, not in the field house, but the outdoor ones. And then, of course, the, uh, the disc golf, uh, lawn bowling, horseshoe pits, uh, and our walking trails are, are all available for, uh, for people to use. Uh, the next slide um, shows our credit union cuplex. These facilities are still closed. Uh, yesterday, the provincial government announced uh, that phase four will be split into parts and that phase 4.1 will be introduced on June the 22nd. So this means that child and youth day camps, uh, spray parks, seasonal and recreational outdoor sports and activities will be able to open. And I can confirm that on June 22nd, our spray parks will be open, as will our ball diamonds and soccer fields. Um, 4.2, uh, which they have not announced a date for, um, will include indoor recreation and cultural facilities, including the credit union duplex, arenas, libraries, and our, uh, our galleries and of course other museums in the community as well. Um, so we await uh, those announcements. Public health orders are of course from the provincial government because this is a health related matter and uh, health is a purview of, of the province and so as municipal government we react to what uh, we are receiving in terms of these public health orders and make sure that the safety of our citizens is is always uh, driving our decisions and uh, and whether or not facilities are, are open and closed. But we do have some developments in parks and recreation that uh, we can share. The next slide shows the uh, brand new uh, play structure at the Senator Herb Sparrow Park. The, uh, the new play structure will be introduced this summer. And uh, this actually, this tender was awarded a couple of council meetings ago. We will also be here introducing a new irrigation system at the Blue Jays Diamond. That is the new uh, ball diamond behind the Don Ross Center. Um, of course, we're also focused on the flowers within our community. You've probably seen them uh, and hopefully enjoyed them in our barrels, pots, gardens, and, and hanging baskets. Council just approved a uh, bid for vending machine services at the Credit Union Cuplex when they open. Uh, this will be in the Co-op Aquatic Center in the Nation's West Fieldhouse. And of course, our parks crews are working very hard on ensuring that our green spaces are uh, cut and trimmed and, and uh, suitable for, for public use. Um, some areas are taking a little bit longer than normal, so we just ask for uh, uh, everybody's patience. Uh, the next area is our city operations. Uh, this uh, There's a couple of big projects uh, in process right now. I'll mention the first, uh, the trunk main twinning. This is a $13.6 million project. This has been previously announced. 
The only update to provide there is that we have entered the design phase. Um, this work will continue. The public won't see any construction on this until 2021. Um, but I did want to mention it because it's a major project. It will increase our, our uh, storm sewer and sewer capacity uh, for the entire city. And uh, will be when the construction begins, will be a major project. And of course, this is funded uh, one third by our city government, one third by the provincial government, and one third by the, the federal government. Uh, also this summer within our city operations, we are upgrading the SCADA system. SCADA is an acronym for uh, Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. This is the control system uh, for our water uh, distribution and, and, uh, and, and network. It includes communications, graphic user interfaces, uh, computer programs and the like. It was first uh, implemented in 2003. Uh, there's been some issues lately, and so we've made it a priority to actually replace the program, and we expect that that will happen uh, uh, throughout the summer. Uh, the next slide shows something really exciting. Uh, these are the new AMI uh, water valves. So uh, at our last uh, council meeting, uh, council approved uh, the, uh, the bid for the changing of our water meters in residences and businesses throughout the city. This will be a two-year program. And um, it'll start uh, hopefully this summer. We do have some issues around, um, you know, entering people's homes to do this. So we are subject to public health orders. So this is a bit fluid, but uh, we do hope that it'll take, uh, take a few years. Uh, the winning uh, firm was uh, KTI Limited Census. And after they're installed, you might not notice anything physical in your home, um, but you will notice customer service and your ability to uh, interact with uh, with the city will be greatly enhanced and so we're going to show you a few slides starting with the next one uh, we will actually provide as part of this so there'll be a new the new valve installed in all the properties and you as a user will actually be able to log in through the city website into a portal here's the, the login page if we go to the next page you'll see the uh, there we go so that's the dashboard so you will have access to all kinds of information related to your utility usage and you'll actually be able to, to develop uh, alerts and notifications that suit you um, and uh, your usage of, of water. Uh, it will also provide an ability to uh, um, set uh, targets. Uh, if you are going on vacation, you can have a vacation alert. I think the next slide actually shows uh, the notifications. This is actually a, a slide on usage. So be able to track your usage. This is really handy if you have a leaky gasket in your toilet you don't know about, or an outdoor faucet that's dripping that you don't know about. Um, happens to all of us, and at the end of summer, we sometimes get a surprise with our water bill. Uh, this, will, this will ensure no surprises if you're using the, uh, the, the online portal, uh, because you'll be able to not only monitor, but you can, you can set these alerts through email or through text, um, so that you'll be aware of any leaks, you'll be aware of any usage that, uh, that you don't know about and be able to, uh, to monitor your, uh, your alerts. The next slide shows uh, the alerts uh, there. And so this will be, uh, be something that uh, will greatly improve uh, customer service within our city utility. We're very excited about it. And uh, this is something that uh, uh, we have been targeting for quite some time and hopefully we can get started uh, very soon on this. The next slide shows the meters for rental properties. Um, and uh, so, those individuals, those properties with that uh, have rentals, you'll likely see this in your recent summer. Uh, also within our city operations, um, we introduced a new uh, snow plow blade. Uh, this blade is, uh, has a five position uh, capability to allow us to uh, have greater efficiency, especially when removing snow around chicanes. Uh, chicanes, people call it bulb out. Uh, we're seeing a lot of more of them around the, uh, the cities downtown, and this will work with the snow thrower uh, to quickly remove snow, uh, especially in our downtown core, and make snow removal so much more efficient. Um, next slide, please. So we'll enter now to uh, corporate services. There's a lot of updates here, and this is perhaps where residents and visitors will see the most, uh, most visible activity throughout the summer. So I'll just begin by saying that uh, Montana's restaurant construction is underway. Um, I understand that the plan is to open in the fall. But we're at, that's a great example of, uh, of a new enterprise and a new uh, building development in our city. And we're actually having a very strong year. Uh, so far we are $6 million in building permit values 
Uh, and considering everything going on this year, that's a very strong number. Uh, the next slide shows uh, one of the residential neighborhoods uh, that we're going to be doing. This isn't actually that <laughs> street because we haven't started it, but it is uh, actually fairly representative. Um, we will be doing work on 95th Street between 15th and 16th Avenue. Now this image actually shows you what that work looks like. Uh, it's a big project, there's a lot of excavation, and we are replacing undergrounds. Uh, the utility work is planned for July 24th to September 4th, and this will include road closures, obviously, if you look at the picture, uh, but there will be well, water service disruptions and drinking water advisories uh, in place throughout that time. And of course, communication will be very strong uh, with all the properties that are affected there. Uh, roadway restoration will follow that underground work and it is expected to be completed by September the 30th. Um, now, the work uh, being done here will be performed by Sandburn Construction. Uh, that's the underground work. And then the roadways work will be uh, performed by GNC Asphalt. Uh, those were the, the winning uh, um, bids uh, when we went to a public tender. And I also just want to point out those are two local firms uh, doing that work. Another residential neighborhood on the next slide. Uh, this is 101st Street um, from 19th to 20th Avenue. Um, we're going to be doing underground utility work here. This is planned for August 10th to 21st. And again, there will be road closures, water service disruptions, and drinking water advisories. Um, roadway restoration will, can, will follow after that, and that is expected to be completed by September the 12th. And again, the, that work will be completed by Sanburn and uh, GNC Asphalt. Another residential street, uh, this, is, this is not 110th Street. This is underneath 110th Street, and um, actually from 8th to 9th Avenue. Uh, this uh, image actually shows uh, the inside of one of our pipes, and as you can see, there is a, a hole in it. It's at the top of the pipe, uh, sort of that dark area uh, midway through, and uh, you can actually uh, see soil. It needs to be replaced, and so that uh, that work, the underground work, will will begin um, uh, right away and, and be done around June thirtieth. And uh, after that, there will be road closures, of course, rather during that, road closures, water service disruptions, and then the roadway work will follow, and we expect that that will be done by July 25th. And again, that work will be done by Sanburn and uh, GNC Asheville. Uh, so those are several residential neighborhoods. We'll move now into uh, some commercial uh, construction and commercial areas. This is um, a drawing of uh, the, some of the work to be done in our city's downtown. Uh, this is actually taken right from the downtown master plan that was approved in early 2017 by city council. Um, that was actually also the first year when we began the um, uh, replacement of underground infrastructure and then the facelift of the above ground infrastructure in our downtown, making 2020 the fourth year of uh, downtown replacement of utilities and, uh, and beautification. Um, so the work this year will be on 100th Street, and uh, this particular image shows the intersection, 100th Street going uh, left to right, and then uh, it'll be 12th Avenue going uh, up and down. So the work will go from 12th Avenue to uh, 14th Avenue. Um, it will, the work will begin on the 1200 block and make its way north. Um, roadway uh, construction work, Sorry, the underground work will begin on July 2nd, so that's a couple weeks from now. And then the roadway work uh, will begin August 10th. And the project is planned to be completed for September 26th. Of course, uh, the 1200 and 1300 blocks of 100 Street will be uh, closed uh, to traffic during that time, but there will be pedestrian access uh, to businesses that front that, uh, that street um, from the back alley. Um, there will also be water service disruptions and uh, along, the, along both blocks and uh, that will happen as the underground pipe work proceeds. Now businesses uh, will be and have been notified prior to the service disruptions uh, and affected addresses will be on a drinking water advisory. Um, downtown businesses will remain open uh, with, but there will be alternate access um, in place in order to be able to, uh, to get to them. 
visitors downtown, if you're using Railway Avenue and 100 Street as your way to get home, if you're only using it as, as a way through, you will be encouraged to use Territorial Drive uh, to get to where you're going. And then um, other motorists, um, there will be detours in place for you to be able to, uh, to get around. And again, underground work will be performed by Sandbrink Construction and the roadways by Gene C. Asphalt. Uh, this particular project also means that we will be done 100th Street all the way from 11th Avenue to 20th. Um, the first year of UPAR, which is the Underground Pipe and Asphalt Replacement Program, saw six blocks from 14th to 20th. And so we're going to be finishing uh, the main thoroughfare through the heart of our city. Uh, it'll be all done after this year with all new uh, pipes under the ground and then new asphalt. And so uh, this will be a bit of a landmark year. And of course, uh, this also represents the fourth year, the fourth phase of the uh, beautification of downtown North Battle. Uh, the next slide shows another major project. This one is already underway. This is the uh, Carlton Trail and Yellow Sky Drive improvement. Uh, if you've driven past there, you've probably seen the, uh, the crews doing their work. Uh, so that has been the underground utility work. And uh, this includes the installing a new water main along Yellow Sky Drive. So if you don't know what Yellow Sky Drive is, it's the road that goes north to south. It's immediately east to the Walmart property. And um, so that, in, that intersection needed to be upgraded. We've got the new water main. The underground work is, uh, is now complete. And so we're going to be proceeding with, uh, uh, with the roadway work. So now there will be no further uh, water disruptions in the area. Uh, roadway construction is planned to be completed by July 25th. Uh, and this work includes constructing a center median along Carlton Trail. And this will prohibit left turns and through uh, north and south movements at the intersection of the Frontier Way. So Frontier Way is the road that uh, also goes north and south, immediately east to where Marchwood Warehouse is. And so there'll be a median through Cotton Trail after this project is done. So that will be a right in, right out, as will the access that uh, people currently use in front of the Walmart will also be right in, right out. You won't be able to go straight through Carlton Trail. Uh, the preferred method, of course, now will be the um, Yellow Sky Drive and Carlton Trail intersection, and this will also include a fully lighted uh, intersection there. Um, this project was a priority. We actually applied uh, through the Municipal Economic Enhancement Program, which was announced by the province in mid-April. Um, we're, we're mostly funding the project through that. This project was critical for further development in the Yellow Sky area of North Latimer, including the Montanas. Um, we had a, a, a traffic pattern there that was failing. It wasn't safe. It had to be improved. And of course, in the installation of the water main as well. So uh, by doing this project, we will be able to see, or at least accommodate, uh, further development uh, in uh, the Yellow Sky area of North Battleford. Uh, this slide shows uh, the work as president and of course, uh, if you do see these orange signs, uh, adhere to them and, and drive safely past those crews that are doing important work. Uh, another commercial project that we applied for through the Municipal Economic Enhancement Program was the uh, rehabilitation of the 100 Street Service Road. So this is on the north end of the city. Uh, this is um, a drawing of the work to be done. It's actually the southern portion. You'll notice a traffic bulb on the, uh, what is the south end. Uh, this particular drawing, north and south, goes uh, left to right. And um, the current access, um, there's two accesses onto that service, three actually, onto that service road. The southernmost will be closed. It is not safe. Uh, the turning radius for vehicles is, is not uh, wide enough. And so we're closing that. There'll be a bulb at the end. Right now it's just a dead end, if you're familiar with that. And so that's not safe either. And so this will make uh, that whole area not only safer, um, but uh, it'll, it'll beautify it as well. This is an important project. Uh, it's one of the first things people see when they come into our city from the north. The next slide shows the northern, the northern part of that. You can see the, uh, the two access, accesses that will remain. And then uh, there's some green space work and then uh, a lot of uh, roadway work there as well. So um, we are planning for this. We haven't received approval yet from the province, so we're awaiting that. And uh, once we receive that, then we will uh, announce the dates when we expect this work to take place. And this project has been in the works for a very long time, uh, 13 years, in fact. It's been delayed for one reason or another, uh, usually because of just other priorities and it wasn't a financial reality to be able to do. Um, there was the acquisition of land and designing, but uh, this is a great example of a project 
that was what we call shovel ready. The design is done. It was ready to initiate. And when the province announced the meat program, uh, we were ready and we submitted it. Actually, we had a council meeting to approve that and it was submitted the next day. So we were ready with this and it's just a matter of us uh, receiving approval from the uh, provincial government. Uh, another project that we're waiting for final approval on is the uh, um, rehabilitation of the runway at the Cameron McIntosh Airport. Uh, this is an image of crews doing work on that in a previous year. Um, that airport is really important for the region. It's uh, the means through which a lot of corporations access Northwest Saskatchewan and the Stars Air Ambulance, and, uh, and of course, uh, a lot of other uh, pilots will access it as well. It's actually been a part of the uh, community for a very long time. The last time the asphalt was put in was, I think, 1954. It was in very bad shape and needed replacement. Uh, but rehabilitating an airport runway is an expensive endeavor, and so um, we, had to, we, we did this in, in chunks, in pieces, uh, over the course of several years. This is the fifth year, and we've been able to access the provincial government's community airport partnership program. That provides a 50% subsidy uh, in order to, uh, to uh, rehabilitate community airports. And so we're grateful um, that uh, that program has been available to us. Uh, we're grateful that uh, our applications have been approved. We have heard of our approval and uh, there's been an announcement, but we haven't got the official letter and we're just waiting uh, for that so that we could start this project. So. Um, that'll be our last uh, roadways uh, construction project, um, but we do have some other things in the work in terms of planning and development. The next slide. Um, we are currently working on a friendly annexation of lands that uh, right now are within the jurisdiction of the rural municipality of North Battleford, our, our neighbor to the north and in this case the south a little bit. Um, this is a little triangle, a little parcel that used to be a Crown Colony, and it's the land on which the Saskatchewan Hospital sat, uh, and still sits, um, at least a portion of it. As you can see from the diagram, the blue section at the top shows the new Saskatchewan Hospital. A portion of it is within the boundary of the RM, and a portion of it is within the boundary of the city, uh, which does create some jurisdictional issues in terms of service delivery to the hospital, especially relates to utilities and fire and that kind of thing. Um, the city also has some assets within that area of land. You can see at the top, the FE Holiday Water Plant is in there. Uh, we're uh, also working on the acquisition of a reservoir near the uh, former Saskatchewan Hospital site, right uh, just immediate south of it. We use that water for, uh, we use that reservoir rather for backwash, uh, the FE Holiday Water Plant. And uh, the city's boat launch is also within that parcel. And so um, we've uh, had discussions with the RM, we've had discussions with the Ministry of Government Relations and that process has been initiated. As I said earlier, this is a friendly annexation and uh, we expect the process to be concluded in uh, July of 2021. Uh, but we just wanted to show this map just so there was some clarity on what exactly we were talking about when we were talking about this, this annexation. It's been a busy year as well for protective services. Um, we've had uh, four major projects so far in 2020. The next slide shows the uh, self-contained uh, breathing apparatus, our SCBA. We've uh, undertaken the replacement of the entire fleet of SCBA. This uh, project actually came under budget. It's something we've been uh, we've budgeted through a couple of cycles now, and uh, this will allow firefighters perform better under adverse uh, conditions. It's when they need. Um, uh, and the ability to breathe under, under um, when there's a structure fire or the like. Uh, the next uh, item is our tanker truck. Uh, we've added this to our uh, firefighting fleet. Uh, this was also achieved under budget, and the addition of this vehicle will assist with extinguishing fires when hydrants uh, are not available for use. Um, the firefighting uh, team has also completed the repainting the entire apparatus bay floors. You can see that in these images here. Uh, this was uh, done because the old surface was extremely worn and the surface was breaking down. Uh, we've also replaced the entire lighting system uh, within the uh, fire hall from a ballast type lighting to LED lighting. Uh, and that was done to reduce operational costs. North Alfred Fire Department, on the next slide you see uh, some abandoned properties. They're also working very hard, and especially now that summer's here, this becomes a lot more visible, but um, we've got a number of abandoned properties in the city, and so they're making it a priority to, to address these vacant and, and abandoned properties. 
and that they're brought up to a habitable standard. Um, now, orders will be placed on these properties for either cleanup or to get them up to that standard. And should the buildings fall uh, fail to uh, to meet that standard or to adhere to those orders, uh, we will entertain the demolition uh, to remove the threat to public safety uh, through fire or, or other. So uh, this is something we're gonna be working on uh, right now and throughout the summer. And the next image I think shows you some more abandoned property. You see how they're boarded up there and they, they do possess, or they do pose rather, a threat to public safety and a fire threat. Uh, we'll move on into finance. Um, so at the State of the City on March 2nd, I, I talked about this a lot because it was really important. We've had a significant change of direction over the last uh, year and a half. Um, we have had a lot of achievements during that time. We, we've uh, been paying down our long-term debt. In fact, uh, we've paid over $7 million in the, in the last uh, year and a half on our long-term debt. We're no longer recording that. Land assets as uh, operating revenue. In 2009, we asked city administration to find $500,000 in efficiencies within our operations. Uh, and that was a target they were able to achieve last fall. This year, in 2020, we have asked our administration to find $250,000 in efficiencies, and we are well on track uh, to meet that target. And this has been through um, changing our procurement policies and then asking uh, for bids going to market for items like janitorial supplies, office supplies, telephone, um, you name it. Anything the city procures, we have been investigating uh, and entertaining bids from the market to, to be able to, to find additional efficiencies. Um, this has been a lot of work. It's been a high priority, and it put the city in a much stronger financial position at the beginning of this year. Um, in fact, pre-COVID, we were in a very strong position. But of course, the pandemic has created some unique challenges, and we had to react almost like a business would. When our leisure facilities, when our rec facilities had to close, we, uh, we lost a lot of revenue because when we're operating our recreation facilities, we rely on three sources of revenue. Uh, one is events. Another is um, from people at the, uh, at the front desk paying for their ticket to get in. And the third is our city taxpayers. Uh, we lost our events and we lost uh, the ability for, for us to collect at the door because we couldn't be open for anybody. So we were down to city taxpayers. And so we reacted by uh, reducing our operating expenses in those facilities. And this included the temporary layoff of uh, a number of city employees, uh, especially within the uh, parks and recreation area. Um, now during this temporary layoff, uh, just so you're aware, uh, City Council did offer to extend health benefits to those affected employees uh, during that time. Um, we continue um, within the Department of Finance to, uh, to monitor uh, those efficiencies and to keep uh, our finger on the pulse of how the pandemic is impacting uh, our city operations. Uh, we do anticipate having a special council meeting, um, likely before Canada Day. Um, specifically to address the financial impacts of the, uh, the pandemic uh, as it relates to uh, facility closures and um, the ever-changing public health orders. Um, some of the unique challenges include um, in phase 4.2 we are able for example to open the aquatic center or to open the field house uh, but there will be restrictions on the amount of people that can actually go in. Right now, the restriction in, in this phase is 30 people maximum. I believe in 4.2, uh, the number that is on record is 50 people. So typically on an afternoon, on a weekend, we would have up to 150 people at the Aquatic Center. So now we're gonna be limited to 50, which um, reduces our ability to generate revenue, um, which creates a greater uh, reliance on taxpayers to subsidize. Right now, we aim for a 50% recovery rate on our facilities, which means uh, through uh, event rentals and tickets, uh, ticket revenue, um, that usually makes up 50% of the cost of running a facility. The other 50% comes from our tax base. But we can't have those major events and a really, really limited number of people who come in. And so we are gonna be, we'll be greater reliant on the city's tax base in order to fund the operations of, of those facilities. And so that's uh, important for us to consider. As well, uh, we will be responsible for contact tracing. Uh, public, uh, public health is paramount and 
anybody that comes into city facilities, we have to have the means to um, record who they are, where they live, and how to contact them um, should there be a, uh, a positive uh, COVID uh, test and those in, any of those individuals were were in that facility, every other person would have to be contacted so that they could trace it. So um, these are important considerations, but we'll be considering them in a special council meeting uh, that'll be uh, coming up very soon. Uh, also within finance, um, we are focused very heavily on asset management. And we'll go back to the slides here for a moment. Um, I talked about this a lot at the State of City original address. Uh, I'll talk about one portion of it uh, today, and that's uh, our waste management facility, which has been the first focus of our asset management uh, um, processes. Asset management, of course, is the evaluation of an asset over the uh, uh, entire course of its lifetime. The issue for us right now is our recycling program. Um, back before 2012, if you remember, we had bins in the back alleys that were basically free dumpsters for anybody to throw whatever they wanted in there. We were filling up the, uh, the current cell of the waste management facility at a very fast rate. 2013, we introduced the, the, the curbside recycling, curbside garbage program. And this was done in order to not only help the environment through recycling, but also to reduce the rate at which we were filling the current cell at the waste management facility. Um, since that time, uh, we've been able to evaluate the current rate of, uh, um, of waste coming in. And we, we are forecasting that in 2028, we will have to construct a new cell and the cost of that will exceed $2 million. So our goal is to try to extend the life of the current cell as long as we can so that we can get the most use out of it as well as uh, uh, try to um, come up with a, with a plan that, uh, to fund the next cell that isn't a shock in, in one year. And so um, we have, over the course of the last year, been auditing the recycling program uh, investigating people's bins. If we go to the next slide, um, we've actually been taking a closer and closer look and working with our service provider, Loras. And um, we have a lot of what we call spoiled loads. Spoiled load is when there is a, enough material within a, within a load that is non-recycled uh, or has the ability to contaminate um, other recyclable materials. So, um, Recently, we actually introduced uh, enforcement of recycling. And so we actually have city staff going through the bins on your curb and seeing if there's items in there that are not recyclable. And there's some images coming up here that, that are clearly <laughs> non-recyclable. A guitar, as beautiful as that guitar looks, although it looks like the neck has some damage on the top, um, not recyclable. Your dirt and grass clippings, not recyclable. Rotting food, not recyclable. Uh, pizza boxes that have grease stain, not recyclable. Styrofoam, not recyclable. Uh, these items, by the way, except for the guitar, it's not specific, but <laughs> everything else is on the top of your blue bin. Uh, if, you, if you read that, you should have a clearer understanding of, of what is and is not um, permittable inside the blue bin. We have been enforcing that. Uh, we've been actually uh, issuing violations um, to uh, individuals who are not adhering to the um, recycling rules. Um, we have not been targeting individuals where there's some ambiguity, like uh, plastic shopping bags, which, by the way, are not recyclable, but that can be a little confusing. But these items are good examples of things that are clearly not recyclable, and so we have issued violations for, for items such as these. This is not about a cash grab. This is not about uh, generating revenue. This is about asset management and getting the most life out of that cell as we possibly can. Because when items like these are put into a bin, it's picked up by the truck, it's taken to the facility. Um, by the way, human beings are at that facility and have to sort this by hand. And so a couple of images ago, you saw some dirty diapers. Somebody had to sort through that. Um, and it's, uh, if there's enough material that is non-recyclable, it's considered spoiled. It's bailed up, sent back to us, and put into our lab. And that's a real problem because it's, it's contributing to the filling of the landfill at a rate that we are not comfortable with. And so um, we are asking people to be mindful, read the top of that bin. If you can also visit the, uh, uh, the City of MBE website, get information about what you can and can't put in, as well as the Recycle Coach uh, app, uh, which you can get on your phone as well, which, which also provides some information about if you're confused. Because there's some things like plastic bags that, that may be a little ambiguous or confusing, but, but uh, 
too many people are just using them as a second garbage bin, and uh, that's what we need to have stopped. Next slide, please. Oh, okay, I, I went off script and I talked about this at the beginning, so <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll just continue on. Um, the uh, pandemic itself has uh, changed a lot of things within our city, especially as it relates to parks and recreation and, and so on. But uh, one of the things that, that has happened is uh, um, it's improved our relationships uh, within, the, within the region, uh, especially, actually it's improved our relationships provincially, I think. When the pandemic came, as a city government, um, we were getting information through press releases from the provincial government. And we actually were able to um, use our relationship with the city mayor's caucus to have daily meetings. So if you can imagine all the city mayors and city managers in Saskatchewan would have a conference call every day to talk about issues that we were all facing and then to try to understand the public health orders. And this actually resulted in a, a at that time, daily call with the Minister of Government Relations as well. And so we had a daily call with all the city mayors and the provincial government, um, the minister herself, to talk about the incorporation of the public health orders to get clarity and to provide feedback to her and through her to the rest of the provincial government about uh, the issues that we were seeing on the ground. Uh, that continued for several weeks. Those meetings turned in from daily meetings into bi-weekly meetings into weekly meetings. And uh, we've taken a bit of a break now that the legislature is sitting, but, but the communication was very important for us. And uh, we were also able to provide feedback to the provincial government about uh, what we were seeing and, and issues that we were facing. But here at the regional level, um, our relationships with our neighbors have become particularly strong. At the beginning of this uh, presentation, I uh, mentioned the Sacagawea Relationship Agreement and the Battleford Regional Community Coalition. Um, because we were all recognizing that we were all in this together, the uh, indigenous governments of this immediate area, the town of Battleford and the city of North Battleford established a weekly standing call. And that weekly standing call included not only the leadership of those indigenous and municipal governments, but also representatives of Battle River Treaty 6 Health Center, uh, Indigenous Services Canada, so that's, that's a federal ministry, and the Saskatchewan Health Authority. This has been critical in aligning our local governments with the federal and provincial governments as it relates specifically to this pandemic. It's provided a unique opportunity to develop stronger working relationships and to start focusing on areas where we can all work together for the betterment of the entire region and in most cases the safety of the entire region as well. So we're, we're grateful for that. We're grateful for that, uh, for that uh, relationship and that apparatus, and, and this will continue uh, indefinitely. In fact, our next call is this afternoon. Um, I do want to conclude with, uh, with one last point. I think that uh, all residences of North Battleford and businesses in North Battleford ought to be very proud of our city administration, who did a wonderful job of preparing our city for the pandemic. Uh, when we when we knew that it was likely going to be coming to our community back in January, we started planning. But even before that, the work over the last year and a half and, and uh, solidifying the city's finances and making sure that our city was uh, on firmer ground put us in a position where we have been able to weather this storm uh, in a very, very positive way. And I think given the circumstances, the city is in a strong position. The state of the city is good. Um, and uh, we are prepared for future storms, and there are a couple. Um, we, uh, we heard the provincial budget um, two days ago, and in that budget was something that is of particular interest to municipalities, and that is the provincial sales tax. Uh, within the budget, there's a forecast on the collection of the PST. The PST is important for municipalities because um, the formula for revenue sharing is based on the PST. Uh, municipalities uh, share 0.75 of one point of what uh, the province collects for the provincial sales tax. And there's a, there's a two year lag. Um, based on the numbers we saw in the provincial budget, we anticipate in the year 2022 that there will be a reduction in the municipal revenue sharing funds coming from the provincial government to our city of about $330,000. Uh, so that's something we're going to, uh, to have to prepare for. 
Uh, we also have anticipated uh, increased costs with, uh, with policing in the community. Um, this isn't pandemic related, but uh, uh, there is a, um, um, a labor agreement coming with the, uh, the RCMP. We anticipate a 15 to 20% increase in policing costs within our city. And of course, if our city exceeds 15,000 people in the next census, we will be subject to a new funding agreement with the RCMP. We currently pay about seven, we, not about, we pay 70% of the uh, costs of RCMP members. If we have over 15,000 people, that formula will change to 90%. And so there are a number of financial uh, considerations over the coming years that um, we need to prepare for, uh, and we will be prepared for. Um, it's really important for us to be able to forecast these things, predict these things, and be ready when they come. So uh, with that, I want to thank all of you for tuning in. That's all the information we had to present today. But uh, I am open to questions. I understand there were a couple that were submitted in advance, and then we'll entertain questions from the, uh, from the floor, as it were. Oh, OK. Uh, well, I think one of the questions was about um, um, what can the city do to lower per capita policing costs? Um, so I actually kind of answered that a little bit. Um, right now, RCMP officers are provided to the city, there are 37 of them, by the way, at a fixed cost per officer. Um, now, every community that uses the RCMP is charged based on the number of officers they have, in our case, 37. Um, as a city under 15,000, we pay 70% uh, of the cost of an RCMP officer. That's about just over $110,000 uh, every year for each officer. Um, when our population goes over 15,000, that'll change to 90%. Um, in addition to that, I mentioned the, uh, the labor agreement coming up. We do anticipate a further 15 to 20% increase in those costs. And then, um, uh, then of course, the change to our, our population formula. So, um, we, we need to anticipate those, but at the same time, we've been focused on other areas um, as it relates to community safety and crime that don't, uh, don't include direct policing, uh, specifically the root causes. And if you look at initiatives uh, like the Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design Initiative uh, of the cities, uh, the hub table, even the Sacagawea Relationship Agreement, the original intent of that, and one of the purposes of that is to address the root causes of crime. Um, Areas like poverty, racism, food security, mental illness, addictions. Uh, these are all very important. Um, it's also important to note that these, none of these issues are necessarily the purview of a municipal government. We don't necessarily have authority or responsibility for them, but they impact our community, and so they're important to us. And that's why we wanted to develop a, a coalition of governments um, to align the four orders of government that are in this area, specifically the federal, provincial, indigenous, and municipal governments, so that we can start to address these issues together. It's gonna to be a long road, um, but uh, we've made great strides, and uh, we, uh, we fully hope that these efforts will continue. Uh, Your Worship, the second question has been actually asked of both uh, previously and on the new questions. Uh, it's what's the city doing about uh, systemic racism? Uh, it is both being asked both times, so you answered a big chunk of that just a second ago. <laughs> okay. I thought I mentioned the question there. Uh, so I don't know if everybody watching can hear the city manager who's asking me the question, but uh, in the event, the question was, what is the city doing about systemic racism in our community? Reality is racism has been a problem within this region for, for too long, and uh, particularly among uh, Indigenous peoples, and that's been a priority of our city is to address that. Um, the, uh, the reality is we needed to develop a better neighbor policy. And that's really what the Sacagawea Relationship Agreement has been about. It's been a priority of our council to develop a stronger relationship uh, with the indigenous peoples of Treaty 6, and specifically those that uh, live in and around uh, the battle first, um, so that we could start to focus on issues together, develop mutual understanding, and start to change uh, the way the public uh, um, views um, our relationships and reacts to them. So uh, it's, like I said, it's, it's a long way to go. It's, it's been a priority of ours and it's not going to stop. Uh, in fact, we want to develop stronger relationships and we're gonna keep focused on them. Next question, Your Worship, was, uh, was what's being done to curb the violence in, in the city? 
you touched on it as part of this, but it's a specific question. Yeah, okay, so the question was what, what's being done to curb the violence uh, in the city? So I've talked about policing a lot in the last four or five minutes. Um, I've talked about uh, the efforts to reduce the root causes, and that's really where um, the effort uh, needs to be. I mean, you do need uh, policing to enforce the laws, but you also need to start addressing those root causes so that individuals who end up in a right high life, high risk lifestyle uh, don't end up in a high risk lifestyle. One of the initiatives that's come out in the last year has been a pilot project through our RCMP detachment. It's been a uh, gang task force. So four city members, I, I mentioned earlier that we have 37 members allocated to the city. Four of those have been placed into this task force and their job has been to make North Battleford uncomfortable uh, for, for gangsters, for those who are involved with the gun, gun trade and then the drug trade as well. And they've been doing a phenomenal job. Uh, last summer, um, we had a lot of calls for service uh, related to firearms. After the pilot was introduced on November 1st, uh, there was a lot uh, fewer. In fact, for the few month, first few months, there were none. Um, there was a bit of disruption when the pandemic hit, but um, we are now back to an active uh, gang task force and they're doing great work in our community. Um, this is not just uh, reactive, but it's also proactive in terms of attracting activities and, and doing, uh, doing the best we can to, uh, to ensure that those who are involved in uh, organized crime uh, don't feel comfortable in the city of North Battle. Your next question was, what's the city done to use local professionals to assist in the COVID-19 response? Hmm. And you, you touched on that with the, uh, the issues around uh, working with First Nations and the health groups. Yeah, well, I think, uh, like, specific to the, the question was, what are we doing to engage local groups? And local businesses and the COVID response. So, you know, specific to COVID, uh, yeah, we, we've been working with uh, CBOs, we've been working with Indigenous governments, uh, we've been working with uh, Battle River Treaty 6 Health Centre and, uh, you know, trying to not only share information but develop an understanding in terms of what is happening right now in the region in terms of service delivery for individuals uh, as it relates to their health and uh, the potential threats of, of virus spreading. Um, so, we've also in the early days of the pandemic, we actually tasked a, a city staff person to work with nonprofit organizations to, to understand their needs, uh, work directly with organizations like the Balfour's Boys and Girls Club, the Lighthouse, and then the, the uh, uh, Food Bank um, to, to make sure that their needs were being met. And that was a priority of ours as well. Um, in terms of working with local business, this isn't specific to the, to the uh, pandemic, but I can say that when council was considering the construction work for this summer, it was really important for us to have that work continue in order to provide an opportunity for local people to work. Uh, I mentioned a lot of construction projects today and uh, those projects are going to be performed by local firms employing local people and getting local uh, people working and that was really important to us and that was part of the decision making. Um, next question was, uh, when is the municipal election or will there be any changes in the format or timing? Next municipal election uh, for all urban municipalities, except for resort villages, is November the 9th um, of this year, which is two weeks after the provincial election. Um, any change to the format or timing? No change to the timing, it's a fixed date. Um, the province actually sets the date, um, not the city, which is why they're all on the same date. Um, the format, there will be a report coming to council, uh, bylaw is required. There may be some changes to what we're used to because of the pandemic and because of considerations specific to ensuring uh, people's health. In other words, there may be a single polling station um, instead of multiple polling stations. We've also, by the way, have the added challenge of uh, vol potential volunteer recruitment challenges because there's a provincial election right before it and there could be a federal election at any time. Um, we also, um, so we wanna ensure that we have enough uh, volunteers for the election. Uh, this will also be the first year, and this, this was previously decided, first year that there will be a, an automatic counting machine for the ballots. Typically, the ballots are counted by volunteers throughout the evening. There will now be an automated count uh, through, a, uh, uh, through a machine. So it's still a manual vote, but it will be counted automatically uh, for fast results and a reduced reliance on volunteers. So I hope I answered that question in terms of, or at least I hope I got to, uh, to what the person asking the question wanted to wanted to get in terms of information. Okay, Mr. Mayor, we're just about finished. There's a question by uh, uh, 
individual. There's actually two two questions by an individual about racism towards black people and uh, local black professionals. Use of uh, what he's saying the city was has received some information. Um, I'm not too sure about that one. I haven't got the copy of that yet. Uh, the city dealt with the information that's been submitted. Um, so that information hasn't gotten to the administration. Um, yeah. So I, I don't know. Maybe this one should be done separately with the individual. I've got the name here. We can do, deal with that for you. Uh, the, I guess the question of a racism towards other people's. Well, as a city government, there's no tolerance for racism at all. So, you know, it, it's, uh, we, we, want to pride ourselves on being a community that's inclusive and uh, treats everybody equally. In terms of the uh, um, local professionals and, and uh, information that's been supplied, we're going to have to get back to that, that question asker because uh, I'm not clear exactly what information he's referring to. That's good. And we are out of time, Mr. Mayor. Okay, well, I guess we're out of time. Thank you all for tuning in. And uh, if you have questions after the fact, submit them. Uh, we, will, we will get back to you. We will answer them. And uh, we... Today, just wanted to provide a little update of what you can expect over the coming months and years as we relate to, uh, to the pandemic and the city operations. So thank you so much and uh, have a great day.